All righty, well, we might get started. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fourth and final instalment of our WormWise webinar series, um, organised by Northern Table and Local Land Services. For those of us joining us for the first time tonight, my name is Brianna Carney, and I'm a land services officer based out of Armadale, but servicing the entire region. Um, <laughs> Our presenter for the series is Dr. Nigel Brown, who is a former LLS district veterinarian based out of Glen Innes. Nigel is quite the guru when it comes to all things worm management, and we're very glad to have him on board for this series. So welcome, Nigel. Thank you. Once again, I just have some housekeeping before we kick off for those of you tuning in for the first time tonight. So by default, teams will have your microphone and camera off, so you should be able to hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. There is a Q&A icon at the top of your screen, so if you have any questions, please pop them in there as we go, or there's also a little chat icon at the top, so you can put your questions in there as well if you'd prefer. Um, depending how much how we are tracking for time, we'll address those questions at the end of the session. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so it should be available to you in the next day or two. So without further ado, once again, please welcome Nigel, who will tonight be presenting on liver flick. So over to you, Nigel. Thank you, Brianna. Very nice to be here. Thank you, everybody, for, for, for coming, and I hope you get something from it this evening. I had a nice letter this morning from a lady who'd enjoyed a couple of the previous talks. Um, I, I had a couple of questions, and, and I think I hope I was able to help her. So this evening we're talking liver flukes. So there's a picture in front of you of a of a sheet with liver fluke. Pretty unremarkable, you have to admit. You're not going to make any accurate diagnosis from the outside. Um, let's just move on and see what forms this disease could take. Sudden death. Uh, that's a dead sheep. Uh, and you know my thoughts on dead sheep. Um, and 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 they can get swollen, painful abdomens. They get anemia and jaundice. Jaundice is the yellow pigmentation and that gets into the blood from the uh, iron that is 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 in the blood cells. And when it breaks down, it just floats free and gives that yellowing color. And then you've got hemorrhages and bleeding. And and here's it can be massive outbreaks in places because as you'll see, once the animals are infected, the larvae migrate through the body from the intestines towards the liver and that damage can be rapidly fatal more chronically the uh, you get ill thrift and and i deliberately put a picture of a cow there because that just throw shows how clearly there is significant weight weight loss but obviously with sheep that can be masked so same ill thrift and and anemia for the for the breaking down of the blood cells etc and significant production losses as we go through and and this is the same it is the same species that affects the cattle as affects the sheep um, so we're talking about and here's a series of the sort of pictures you're going to get horrible changes in the liver primarily a lot of thickening because these liver fluke live in the liver and they live in the bile ducts and they've got a really rough skin when you look at it under a microscope it's almost like shark skin and and it rubs and against this the bile ducts makes them very very thick and white the breakdown down of of blood cells and the damage to the liver also affects the 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 how can I say the strength of the blood so the osmotic pressure that's there means that you get a buildup of edema fluid and in cattle and sheep that forms there underneath the jaw so swelling underneath that jaw is, is an indicative we talked about it with Barbara's poll the other night same sort of thing the blood is not good and strong and wholesome so it 
doesn't attract the fluid from the tissues and it accumulates under the chin. And, and that eyeball there is white, is should be white, is now yellow because of that iron that comes through. And those are classical things to be looking for, for, for chronic. And, and those are the chronic liver changes, the chronic buildup of fluid. And when you see that, there's not much recovery left in those livers. So what what gets liver fluke? So we've got cattle that can get it, sheep, goats, alpacas, horses even, wild game, so kangaroos, wallabies, rabbits can get it. And here is the nub, the first of these worms we're talking about, that is a zoonosis. We can get it. So that is not nice. Glen Innes, or just outside Glen Innes, is notorious for being the scene of a major outbreak of, of um, liver fluke in people. And the people actually contacted this disease you can see these red dots where their the cases are it is sheep up and down the uh, the countryside but this was the culprit for this outbreak it's watercress and people had gone down to uh, the, the reeds picked uh, the rivers picked out uh, uh, watercress that was growing naturally and as we will see in a moment it was infected now how many of you are going to ask whether the elephant gets the um, liver fluke. I saw that picture, just had to put it. If you could got sharp eyes, which is what you need for a bit of clinical diagnosis, that's actually a cow disguised as a elephant. Now, I'll go on, I mentioned last night, with this much further without talking of the stomach fluke. The stomach fluke commonly found in our livestock, probably more commonly in cattle, found in the reticulum, uh, which is the honeycomb, looks like that. So that's 3D. So it's not a flat worm like the liver fluke, but it does come and it has, a. although it's a different organism, it does have a very similar life cycle. We'll come to that in just a moment. But this one, as I mentioned last night, this Stomach fluke causes horrible black diarrhea rather than um, the changes to the liver. So here's the life cycle. Your sheep spews out eggs from the liver. Their, their adults are in the bile ducts. They come flush down the bile into the intestines out through the back end. They live for a very short space and then the temperature is right in water they hatch out and they produce a little thing called a myricidium which has got little like little tentacles on the side and it can only li live for about three days will swim through this muddy water where it lands it doesn't want to be too fast the water and then it forms into these things they call redia which are inside the snails two different forms, um, but this snail here, which is the one in the bottom right, is the limnia snail, and that's the one that carries the liver fluke. This one here, the ram's horn, that carries the black, the stomach fluke. But the multiplication can be 600 times from a single myridocidium to the, some of these little um, um, creatures that for, come out from the snail they get back into the water these circaria as they're called and they then latch on to the grass round where the water is lapping around the bottom of the grass or around the watercress and then they form into a cyst on the grass which can live for a year or more even if that grass dries out and this is critical to the life cycle of the parasite because it's that grass either from grazing or from uh, eating hay or something like that that's made from the pasture that's how the contamination occurs so here's a picture of your adult liver fluke it's hermaphrodite for those of you that um, may not have a, a classical education, that's an individual with both male and female parts. And if you're more used to seeing pictures online than classical statues, this 
would portend to be an hermaphrodite with a male half and a female half. It means that they breed within the same individual. They don't lie up against each other and fornicate or do whatever the, the word would be for breeding. Just thought you'd be interested in that. So they lay eggs and they lay about two to four thousand eggs per day. And there's a little picture of them hatching out the little uh, beasties hatching out. And then they go into these small little uh, organisms, which is say with little hair line processes. So they're laying substantially more eggs every day than my chickens. Here's the snail. Won't go into great details about this, except to say that if you've got the snail in your environment, then nowadays in most of these areas I showed on the map, you are going to have liver fluke potential. Without the snail, so in dry pastures where the snails can't live, you're not going to get the complete life cycle building. So one of the strong control methods that we need to do is to think about how can we improve the drainage of the land so that we don't get these uh, snails surviving so we're breaking the life, life cycle. Here's fluky pastures. You can see by the sorts of plants that they are, um, the muddy sort of areas where the tracks are and then all that sort of slush in between that can be wet for long periods of time. Here's those larvae. So one miracidium can produce, as I think I said, 600 of those metasacaria on the, the grass. It takes them uh, maybe six or seven weeks up to several months to complete that life cycle. And again, that is, is very uh, critical. So we've got large numbers of those. What happens when they're eaten is that the acid in the stomach of the animal that's eaten them, whether it's sheep or whatever, uh, starts off the development of those metasacaria into a little uh, next stage of the larvae, which is going to migrate through. So it, it goes through the rumen into the abomase, and that's where the acid kicks in. So then the damage is done as they migrate through from the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, through towards the liver. And it's that damage, which can be done over six to seven weeks, maybe, that is really dramatic. Now, it's going to be an eight, to 10 weeks after infection before we get eggs being produced. That's critical in making your diagnosis. The shortest possible life cycle is reckoned to be 17 weeks. So those cysts could come in either, as we said, from grazing, but potentially from hay, even from silage if it's not very good silage because it doesn't this it the, the acid of a good silage will will start those metasacaria hatching. The dap there's that picture of underneath that arrow of the shark skin like surface. The damage that is done by these migrating larvae can actually allow clostridial organisms to grow and develop in that damaged tissue. It's another le lecture by itself, but that's the sort of environment that clostridial organisms like to um, like to be in is that bruised damaged tissue and the disease they call is it causes rapid death and it's called, called Black's disease. So here's a list of the signs of liver fluke disease, sudden death, lingering death, ill thrift. We've talked about all those different sorts of syndromes. And you can see that, in fact, some of those are very similar, not all of them, but some of them are very similar to what you might see in other worms. And how I've gone on and talked about before about the differential diagnosis. So sudden death, anthrax. Barber's pole, Clostridia, which we talked about, um, and certain of these other diseases like a pneumonia, for instance, some of the other parasites, and then various septicemias. But if we look for the more chronic disease, look at some of those chronic diseases we've got. 
malnutrition, Yoni's disease, still some more parasites, and pregnancy toxemia, white muscle disease, selenium deficiency. These are some of the common diseases that, that can need to be ruled out when you're making a diagnosis for liver fluke. And I can't say it often enough, it's making the diagnosis ruling out these other things that is that is critical in going forward and managing. So it comes back to the clinical examination. So that's why I put up a jokey picture of a cow with a, an elephant's trunk on it, but it's little observations like that that are going to help you get to your diagnosis more rapidly. It's going to take a certain length of time, as we've seen, for these um, larvae and and the eggs that get in there to become adults and causing damage so the age of the individual that are affected is going to be of major important and of course the property history if you've never had tape uh, sorry liver fluke on your property and suddenly you get something there you've got to think why we had a lot of problems a few years back when people were buying in cheap food or being given gifts of food after the drug, because people were made elsewhere were making hay from whatever pastures they could, and they weren't saying, oh, this was a water meadow. So these pastures were um, impregnated with, with metasakeri. That introduced them onto the property, and people that had never had the liver fluke before suddenly had massive outbreaks of it. So cutting open and having a good look on carcasses is your good first step. I'll say it again. If you've opened up and had a look, you may not recognize what it is, but you've got a camera on your phone. You can take a picture, send it through to your LLS vet, and they can rule out some of the possibilities and see that you're having a serious go at doing it. Now, I put uh, worm egg counts in there. It is critical, but and I've talked about that with the rounds. But what you need to remember is that these fluke eggs round up the stomach fluke or the liver fluke are much bigger, much bigger than the um, eggs of roundworms. They are much heavier. And the salt water that you use for ordinary roundworm eggs is not strong enough to support the weight of the liver fluke eggs. So they drop out of the picture and you cannot see them in a normal test. So you have to use a different solution. I'm not going down that road, but I, I said to the lady this morning, I said, the best thing you can do is learn to do your own worm egg counts. You will learn so much from that. So Here's a picture, bottom right here, of, of the fluke eggs and the ordinary eggs in the same picture. You wouldn't normally see them like that, but you can if you use the right solution. But look how different they are. There's a, what they call a little a perculum at this end, and that's where the, the liver fluke larvae are going to come out. Now, what's a significant number? To me, one egg is significant because that means you've got liver fluke in there and you have got, therefore, a potential problem. You, your history will then influence what you're going to be doing about having one egg. But if you've never had them before, that one egg is significant. So if we go through to, oops, let me just go back. I think I double click. We're talking about pre prevention. There is no effective method to increase host resistance. So we're, we can rule that one out. There's no vaccines or anything. So we need to be um, looking at this grazing management. We need to be, as I said earlier, using earthworks in various stages to improve the drainage, um, to to get rid of the habitat for the snails. When I was a little boy, we used copper sulfate um, to kill snails along with uh, this. But this was back in England and we were obviously in smaller paddocks, although we called them fields. Um, and that may be an answer is to look at breaking down your um, your fences, which have probably been there since the, the time of the first fleet, very nearly. Um, they may not have, have build them in the right place with respect to liver fluke environment. Let's look at this next lot of drug treatments. Active ingredients, 
there. The, the Clasantel is very effective at the moment, uh, but don't use it all the time. Otherwise, we will be getting um, drench resistance to that. Many of these other drugs on the left are totally inappropriate to use. You might as well pee in their ear for all the good it's going to do. And, and just to give you a little note, if you do come into the problem with the stomach fluke, um, that one is is nilzan is the active uh, drench that we need to use and you need to use double you need to use it two weeks apart so two doses two weeks apart so my take-home message is there don't guess use science and knowledge test defeaties routinely but use appropriate testing do your own science, egg countings, clinical examinations, post-mortems, and again, do test after the drench to make certain that you're, you're being effective and do link with your professional services. There we go. That's a very quick run through and summary of, of liver fluke. Um, for, for some reason, one slide didn't come. You haven't seen one slide, uh, my penultimate one, because there is a lab test that you can do, which is to collect blood from the sheep. Um, and, and that blood, you can then test for the ELISA. Now, ELISA is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay test big long name the second test you can do on blood on blood is for the fluke antigen now antigen is measuring the actual presence of the fluke and the antibodies are, or the elisa test is meanting antibodies against the fluke but you have to judge those responses uh, or the results i should say as to whether you have treated recently because if you treat effectively say clisantel and kill off those parasites today you can collect a, a blood test in two or three weeks and it will turn up positive because the antibodies are still there because they don't die off immediately so that's a critical thing to be aware of is interpreting results with the basis i'm sorry that slide didn't come up it's shown on my screen but um you didn't get a chance so they, they, i can't go back to it um just for some reason one of those furfies thank you very much indeed Thanks, Nigel. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so we have a goat producer in the audience who has some bottled jaw in their goats at the moment. Um, they'd like to know roughly how long does it take for a fluke drench to take effect and how long will it take for the bottle to subside? Okay. So if we know it straight away and we it wasn't a barber's pole and it wasn't one of the other things but i given at this time of year the two would be but it's it's a question of making certain that the diagnosis is right not that it's one of the signs but it all is that's going to very much depend on the quality of food because what you've got to do is to get the food the nutrition back in so that the body can repair itself over the next two or three weeks and um, iron is needed to put in now obviously the in general the soil has got a lot of of of, 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 of iron in it which is great but if you've got a browser in your your husbandry is such that you're feeding your goats off the ground so they're not getting access to much soil, it will be much slower than if you are giving them a form of iron supplement um, to make certain that they're going to actually get active in their active iron intake. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, we also have another question saying, what's your opinion on the product of Biowormer? Biowormer, I think, has got great potential, but it's 
cost is is very awkward when you're talking about large numbers. For anybody unaware, you're basically, as I understand it, the bioworm is a is a sort of fungus that wraps around the the larvae and then entraps the larvae and breaks the life cycle that way. So if you've got um, animals that you're wanting to protect in small numbers, prize winning animals or rams or something like that, I think it has a lot going for it. But I think as a, as a, and it's not my judgment call to make as to whether you do use it, but I think in large, excuse me, got the hiccups, in large numbers, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's not cost effective. Yes, thanks, Nigel. Um, and someone would also like to know what size are the snails? Are they like just as big as your normal garden snails or much smaller? No, nope. no, nope, no, nope, nope. much smaller. Can you see? They're like, they're, well, you probably can't get the permission. So what's that? Less than a centimetre. Say, if I were to say a centimetre, that would be the case. If you, if you, if you get snails, you can see them. You can easily go online and look for for the names of them, but they're quite small. But what you can always do is just pick a few up. Um, and put them into a little pot, maybe with a bit of weed or, or grass or a bit of water so that they don't die and, and take them in one of the um, land services officers. I think that uh, that Brianna is very good at picking those up and she can look at it for people. Can't you, Brianna? There we go. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've got a bit of a question. So you said that um, they can survive on pasture as sort of cysts on the on the pasture for prolonged periods, for up to twelve months. Can they survive yep. longer during drought periods? And if so, will they perhaps catch producers off guard as soon as wetter conditions yep. Yep. arise? So, so the dis the distribution of the metasicaria and grass is really interesting because, of course, in in drought periods where there's not the water, uh, there'll be a little bit of water, hopefully, that will be in the bottom of hollows, whereas when it's really wet, they will be spread out, so they'll be much more concentrated. But what happens is when there's it's drought, it's only in the bottom of the gullies where the, um, where the sheep are going to graze because they'll get that last bit of the green pick, so they're really concentrating on everything, and they will pick them up there. So, so yes, they will survive longer. Um, so if you've got hay that's being kept, say, in, in good dry conditions without the UV, etc., that, that will give it, we believe, a much longer lifespan and, and, and much more likely to cause damage. Thanks. And can you often see um, perhaps some subclinical effects or just pre just effects on production, such as wool growth, staple strength, those, those those sort of things, just even in small burdens? I know you said that a threshold yes. of just one yes. egg is enough to treat. So yes. would you start seeing production effects yes. at that point yes. as well? Right. I, I think you you do see you see them there all the time because some of these these flukes will live for long long periods months or years inside the sheep so they're causing the damage all the time so the more the damage goes on you're getting production loss even if it comes to slaughter because there'll be condemnations the risk of abscesses etc going on so yes you will you will get them so it's something that if you can break the cycle. Um, and get rid of them, it's fine. But if it's if it's coming down through the the water that oozes down your hillside from your neighbour, it's it's very difficult to break that cycle. Um, another question: We are almost out of time. But we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, what creates a long active drench compared to a short acting drench? Well, it's the formulation in which they make it so that the, the, the drug is active in there. Um, it's an area that I've never really gone into is the pharmaceutical side. I, I had the option years ago early in my career and, and, and decided not to go down it. So I'm not the person to ask on that. I, it, it's all to do with the formulation um, and what keeps it going there. And that's a, a chemical mystery as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Nigel. I think that's all the questions 
um, we have for tonight. Um, so that brings us end to, to the end of webinar four of the WormY series. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone who has come along to each of the new each of the segments and to the new faces joining us tonight. And of course, I'd like to say a big thank you to Nigel for taking the time to present to all of our Northern Tablelands landholders and sharing all your Wormology wisdom. Um, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, the recording will be available in the next day or two. And if you didn't register for the previous sessions and would like to view those recordings, um, please send me an email and I'll get those to you as soon as possible. Um, and as before, if you'd like any further information um, about any of the topics covered tonight, please get in touch with myself or um, one of our officers and we'll be able to help or put you in touch with um, the right contact. So thanks everyone and thanks Nigel. Um, that concludes our WormY series and have a great night everyone. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye.